Welcome, Metal Maniacs, to the Purple Kurt Podcast. I'm your host and lifelong defender of the faith, Kurt Hoffman. Um, ironically, this podcast started as a uh, Prince related podcast, but you know, I you know I am a self confessed metal maniac of forty years, almost forty years ago. I saw these guys up here. This is a shot that I took on my phone from the recent gig at Reading, Pennsylvania at the Santander Arena. And if you're in the Philly metro area or somewhere around PA that you're not that far to drive to see a gig at Santander Arena, let me tell you something. What a great venue. So today's topic, I'm here to talk about this tour the Invincible Shield. I'm going to try to keep this, uh, as you can hear, I'm a little nasally, a little sinusy. <sighs> Excuse me. A uh, little under the weather. But, um, and I called out today just to recover. I'm going to make this brief, but I did want to keep the topic since the topic is the iron. You always have to strike while the iron is hot. And speaking of hot irons, let me tell you, the gig on Sunday, April 21st, ironically, Prince's uh, eighth anniversary of his passing. I celebrated music in general by these guys at the altar of the Santander Arena for Judas Priest. And, you know, there's a lot of trolls and comments out there that it's not Judas Priest anymore, that it's a Rob Halford covers band. And, you know, enough, enough about that. Um Richie Faulkner and Andy Sneap, whom I did get to meet, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, have kept this franchise re-energized and alive. Invincible Shield, without any blowing smoke up anybody's ass, is simply one of the best albums they put out in years. Uh, you know, they were, I mean, the last couple albums they put out, I would say Firepower's in that category where most and all the songs I really still re-listen to. But this new Invincible Shield album is something that I've gone back to the well and and drunk from it and have gotten so much. Uh, the marriage of music and lyrics are simply, you know, I've seen people do troll, like, oh, you know, looks like Rob Halford's using chat GPT and all this stupid shit. So you can just drop that trolldom rhetoric. We can think for ourselves... If, you, if you're a lifelong priest fan, you know that there's been some middling periods. I love, I'd say this is as strong as album as Angel of Retribution, even stronger. Vocally, everything. So getting back to the ta task at hand, because I'm going to go all over the place a little bit. And if you've watched my stuff before, I don't do this consistently like on a daily basis. I do this when I get some time. And today's going to be short and sweet, which for many people will be a blessing. Um, but I wanted to share my thoughts. If you have seen, this was the third show of the tour at Santander Arena on Sunday, April 21st. Sabaton opened up, which was a real classy gesture for uh, Priest to have them on. I believe for the 50th anniversary tour, originally Sabaton was to have been the opening act. I had tickets for the Man Music Center back in 2021 when things got canceled. And um, they've honored their uh agreement i guess to have these guys as an opening act so that says a lot about priest um and the priest machine <laughs> jane andrews manager and what have you that they wanted to make good on having these guys as an opener act. so good on them for that um i like some sabaton songs i can't well not sit here and tell you i know all the names of the titles but i have listened to a few of their albums i like the power metal stuff there's a place for that Certainly Iron Maiden has kind of gone in that direction a little bit. Lyrically, it reminds me of a lot of some of Steve Harris's Iron Maiden, like um, a matter of life and death kind of stuff, lyrically, not musically. But um, live, they were very congenial, very, you know, little nice little banter, the machine. There's just a little too much backing triggers and back, backing tracks for me that, you know, and that's been a sticking point for a lot of us that like live music. Now, Priest uses a lot of live tracks for like mainly for intros. Uh, but um, 
Sabaton, I do want to make mention, you know, they were they were a nice congenial opener. I'm just not a real fan of all the pre-recorded backing tracks to supplement their their flyback. I have nothing against them personally, but that kind of you know. um I will also say that I was part of the backstage experience. So let me grab some stuff. Um yeah, I'm in my house, so I'm uh, doing this kind of on the fly. Um, for those who did the backstage experience pass or are thinking about doing it, but you're like, I don't know if I want to spend the 250 bucks. I've been burned on a VIP package before. I will say I felt like I got 90% of what I wanted out of the, um, out of the thing. Excuse me. I'm taking my jacket off for a second here. I'm shivering to show the priest shirt. There she is. Yes, it's a $50 t-shirt. Yes, you can order it online. Slightly cheaper, but by, by the time you get, get it with the shipping and all, that's going to be about 50 bucks anyway. So, <laughs> excuse me. Get that man a glass of water. So at any rate, you get a swag bag. You get a swag. Whoop. Where'd I go? You get a swag bag. Okay, Judas Priest. You get an autographed photo let's see if i can show this you got an autograph photo it's the artificial background here <clears throat> uh you get an autograph picture which doesn't really show up with my artificial background but i'm not going to take the artificial background off because i don't want to show my personal home i'm doing this on the fly like i said <clears throat> but you got guitar picks in there you got a little backstage pass thing you got some ephemera you know Tour pass stickers from the past couple of tours. Uh, you did get a T-shirt, which they did not have my size in, so um, they're mailing it to me. But if you decide to do the VIP backstage experience, I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> if you go on my Facebook page, I'll be uploading some photos from that. Um, I'm really trying to keep my talking to a minimum, but I, I had to talk about this today. So, oh. I'm getting shells here, guys. So this is going to be a short video, but I, I had to capitalize on this because the tour is happening now. So um, you will be wise to, if you can afford it, you know, you're paying however much you're paying for a ticket to see the show. I mean, I had a single ticket. My husband does not like metal at all. <laughs> Excuse me. My husband does not like heavy metal at all. So he doesn't, want to see this kind of thing but i did and um it it's very much worth it you know if you're a single ticket buyer you get a better seat up front closer anyway and i met some really nice people along the way including a photographer who uh, we'll get to in a minute but with the universe experience there is a person who is in charge like your tour guide you know shepherd or shepherd and that's shepherdess in this case her name is polly She's out of the Louisville, Kentucky area. She's a sweetheart. She's one of the few Americans that are working as part of this crew. Um, some of the we got to meet all the different lighting people. We got to get on the motorcycle, Rob's motorcycle. Got to see Richie's setup. Got to see uh, Andy Sneep, who did sneak by the backstage. There's a lot of people complaining that you don't get to meet members of the band, but in fact, you do. <clears throat> may not be the guys you want to meet, obviously, like Rob and stuff like that. Rob's resting his voice for the show. So, and clearly that paid off in dividends because he was absolutely fucking flawless. I'm telling you, uh, the European beginning, <clears throat> the European beginning was very, um, you know, he was just trying to get his chops going and, and warm up. You know, he's 72 year old man uh, having to sing opening with panic attack i you know it used to be oh god how's he going to do painkiller now it's like how is he going to open panic attack the guy is on firing all cylinders but meanwhile you don't get to meet probably him <clears throat> unless you get an actual backstage pass traditional backstage pass this is more how the sausage is made backstage pass you meet all the technical crew lighting sound They've got a 24-year-old American gal whose name is escaping me at the moment. 
I wish I'd written some of this down, but I didn't have a piece of pen and paper and all, or my phone to make notes. I was too busy enjoying the experience. She's a 24 year old American who, you know, didn't graduate college, but went to the school of hard knocks, worked her ass off and is running sound and does a damn good job. Um, and explained how they used the previous night's audio, filter it with digital technology into the whatever venue they're in and tweak it. And that gives them a pretty good idea of what the sound's going to be like accounting for people in the audience. It's incredible what they're, what they're able to do. And then the lighting guy explained his bit. I did get to talk to uh, Andy, do it again, Sneep. If you're a fan of uh, Rob's books, you'll know that he's brought Rob's, you know, recorded output back to another level. Um, and that also has, I think, bolstered Rob's confidence a lot. So anyway, but do the, do the back, you get to meet some really cool people who are true super fans. And so my experience with that personally was I got to meet, if you are a liner notes junkie like I am, you will know the name Steve Weiss Guy Weiss. Okay, he was not at the show, but one of his assistants was, who is a photographer who happens to live in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, not terribly far from where I personally work in Collegeville. <sighs> uh, until I called out today because I'm just not feeling well but and i'm going to go back to bed after this but um i have felt i needed to share my experience with you guys obviously i'm wearing a hat today and having a bad hair day but there you go um so the backstage experience again I'll, I'll iterate is, is incredible but this guy that also got the backstage experience pass and he gets comped on it is a guy named bobby dreher d-r-e-h-e-r -E -E look him up He's worked with Neil Zalauer. He's worked with and is assistant for Mark Weiss Guy Weiss. If that name means anything to you and you're a liner notes junkie like I am, he did the photography for the Bon Jovi Slippery When Wet album. He did the fucking cover for Twisted Sisters Stay Hungry. He's worked with other artists as diverse as Christina Aguilera. The guy's done a photo or two that you've no doubt if you're a heavy metal hard rock fan, you've seen his work. And, um, you know, he's in his 70s now. He's still looking good, too. But this guy, Bobby, uh, he was a, a mensch. He and I got along like a house on fire. Just started talking about mutual people we knew. His uh, partner is also involved in uh, different avenues and stuff. So uh, we had that in common. But we have a mutual acquaintance whose husband is a keyboardist in a funk band that he and I share a commonality because my husband's workmate is his one of his friends at this college. So anyway, that's a little sidebar. But you, got, I was able to get so much more out of the experience walking around Santander Arena. It's like you got a built-in tour of the of the facilities there, and how they make the sausage and all the costumes. And I sang at the Kennedy Center for 14 years. So I know where I, where have I speak. Um, it was really great to talk to these people who know clearly what they're doing. Many of whom have been working for Priest and other bands like Maiden, the one guy that did the, the uh, lighting and visual effects, you know, on the, the screens, putting up the words on Living After Midnight and Love Bites and all the projection stuff. Um, he worked for Maiden from the Blaze Bailey years up to a Matter of Life and Death tour. So they, you know, these guys know what they're doing and do it extremely well. So uh, I highly recommend it. So back to the interpersonal experiences and people that I'm friends, instant friends that I made. You know, when you're a diehard fan of any musician and you meet people who are of a like mind, you almost feel like extended family. And I think I got much more of that out of this experience than anything, because we know what we came here for and we know how much this band and yes, in a way it is a franchise, but either way that I look at the current version of Judas Priest is that it's, it's a, it is a brand. It is bigger than any of the members combined. And the fact that Santander, the Santander arena show on Sunday was Absolutely fantastic. I enjoyed it way more than the reunion tour in 2004. 
And I know, Glenn, and that might sound, might sound blasphemous, but I think post-pandemic and all that's happened to this band, you think about the X factors of uh, Richie. Uh, you know, we had the pandemic. Then he had an aortic aneurysm, burst his uh, a vein, a main vein in his aorta, had to have a 10 and a half hour surgery for that. You had the pandemic going on at that point. You had Rob's prostate cancer, and then the other dreaded P word, Glenn Tipton and Parkinson's, these last 10 years or more that he's been dealing with this. All this shit that that band has gone through, and here Richie's still with us. Let, let, let's, let's, let's be honest. Richie Faulkner has re-energized this band, and if we had lost him, that just would have been a tragedy beyond itself. And if he didn't come back to the band because of this heart thing, that would have been understandable, but it really would have hurt the band I think in a main way, because he's brought so much to this band and anybody dismissing him saying he's a KK clone has clearly, and I saw KK's priest recently and got to talk briefly with KK himself. If you go on my Facebook page at Kurt Hoffman, you'll see that. I truly love both bands and Tim Ripper owns is a lovely guy. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like having relatives in a divorced family in a way where you got KK's priest on one side, it's kind of like the stepmother of the of band franchise, and then you got the originals with with the new wife, which a figure to a figurative new wife with with with, with Faulkner. I, I, I'm okay with two different. I, I'm okay to go to two different households for the holidays, so to speak. You know what I mean? They're keeping this music alive. I mean, live music in general is dwindling because of streaming, because of pre-recorded artists, and we need to keep this shit going and have real music by real musicians playing real stuff on stage, no backing tracks, nothing canned or phoned in. And these guys, both bands, KK's Priest and Judas Priest, are doing just that. Personal feelings aside, um, you know, and, and these guys are living up to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, 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 nomination. I know they created a special award for priests to get in there because you know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Whatever you think about it, I'm 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 like nonplussed either way. I'm glad that they've gotten their credit for having some cultural significance in any way they can get it because they clearly deserve it. Um, they're never going to get a Kennedy Center Honor Award. Okay, I'm on a, going on a diatribe. I do apologize, but you know I'm very passionate about this band, as you can tell, and. Any iteration of it that keeps this catalog of music going, I think that is the bigger picture aspect that we all need to look at. And any trolldom about no KK, no Glenn, no Priest, it's just, dude, move on. Get out of your parents' basement already, okay? Move on with your life. You know, you're making comments just to jack yourself off. I just hate shit like that. So anyway, but there's some great fans there. So I told, I'll go back to the show itself, Sabaton. If you've been following them on YouTube and their American leg of the tour, they've been switching some songs out, which is great. They were doing that a lot more of that stuff by the time you got to the end of the Firepower tour. They were throwing in Necromancer and like other Traders Gate and stuff. I miss those shows. I wish I'd seen them. But uh, they, they're not doing as much switching around on this leg of the tour. They're keeping it a, a pretty decent framework opening with firepower or firepower, Jesus, opening with the uh, panic attack. And, you know, then the, yeah, I got another thing coming follows that and then on and on. But they did Sunday night. I mean, and many people commented about this, Bobby and I, you know, he, the guy that I met sat one row in front of me and one seat over complete happenstance. Right. Or is it, I always believe in serendipity. So, he and I were ripping. He had his long telephoto lens, which he's, he was allowed to bring in um, because they didn't have a media pass for him to be in the pit to, to film the first, to photo the first three songs of the set, which is usually what a lot of photographers do, media pass people act to have access to do. But he got to shoot the whole show um, because of his credentials. So they did last, they did that show on Sunday, April 21st, they did The Sinner. And 
you know, for those of us who have been following the band's early days, and I saw them first 40, almost 40 years ago in 1984 at the Cap Center in D.C. with Great White opening up. The center was just one of those show pieces of obviously KK doing the whammy bar stuff. And like Victim of Changes was his moment as well. But they did the center and Victim of Changes in, in the same set. Uh, and then, of course, Saints in Hell, I'm glad, has come back into this set as well. And I saw the premiere of them doing that live at the fire opening of the Firepower Tour. So Rob sang it well then. He's, he's even singing it better now. I don't know what Magic Forno he's doing or what the hell he's doing, but let's just talk about Halford for a second. Seeing a band like Judas Priest, and this, this is a former opera singer talking here, is like going to the opera. You know the tunes in the opera. You're familiar with some of the stage movements and stuff like that, but you're going to hear the singer sing the notes and what rob halford does is the highest of high wire acts opera singers have it easy compared to what he does the fact that he's not only doing a credible job on the mid-range and all this stuff he's hitting these notes better than he did on the on the reunion tour 20 years ago he truly is getting better with age whatever experience life experiences the coming out process over the years the fact that his books have just let everything out on the table and he feels like he has nothing left to hide. Uh, psycho I think for him, it's a psychological journey. He's clearly just it's so in tune with himself right now. Uh, I'm just in awe of the guy. I'm impressed with what he can still do and he owes us nothing. First of all, this band owes us nothing. We've stuck by them through thick and thin, but this guy is always giving 150%. And even when he only has 50% to give, depending on the night that he didn't get a lot of sleep, the guy leaves everything out there on the stage. He truly does. And nothing was more evident uh, of that than uh, Sunday night. Victim of changes. He holds that long note out on pitch in tune. So freaking long. I was like, no, there's no way he's going to hold it that long. He's holding it that long. And I know you've got digital delay effects and all this other stuff. He's not using backing tracks on that stuff, folks. It's him doing it. The vocals are front and center and they're live. If they're compressed in the microphone, if there's a little bit of echo effects, so what? He's been doing that for decades. He got a page out of Robert Plant's book you know, who's, who's at the forefront of t technology doing, you know, vocal effects. So that's, you know, been the de, de rigueur. That's, been, that's standard issue shit in the rock world where you got people like John Bon Jovi, who's had vocal surgery. I actually know John Bon Jovi's otolaryngologist because he was my otolaryngologist and his vocal therapist. So I know where, where I speak on this matter. There are guys like Bon Jovi that can't even sing living on a prayer. Rob could probably fill in for Bon Jovi after he's done a show of his own and sing them not tuned down. That's nothing short of a miracle. You got guys like Steven Tyler who, who, who had to take a break from fracturing your larynx. I don't know how the hell you do that. Somebody must have karate chopped them in the neck or something. I don't know how the hell that happens, but somebody's got to explain that one to me, but I'm sure there's somebody out there who knows more about that than I do. What I'm trying to say is Rob Halford is in that one percentile. I think the only other person that really fits in that category, uh, John Gallagher of Raven, still singing like he did 40 years ago. Glenn Hughes, Deep Purple fame and all the other bands that he's done. Currently, Black Country Communion's got a new album coming out, but they don't really tour. But you know, Glenn's been out doing the Deep Purple, classic Deep Purple live stuff from his time in the band. And he's taking stuff down a semitone, but he's still got those incredible high notes. So uh, these guys are clearly in a very small percentage of people who can still not just pull off doing this, but doing it better than ever, I, honestly. And I'm a hypercritic. I mean, again, vocally, Rob is doing this 10 times better than he ever did in the opening reunion tour for Angel Retribution, hands down. You can't compare. If you go back and listen to any of the footage from those shows, and listen to today, forget about, forget about it. 
it's it's incredible. So you can obviously tell I'm a huge Rob Halford fan. He's meant a lot to me in so many different ways, and I will potentially have a chance to meet him on my birthday in Syracuse. I've mentioned that before a couple of times. Um, you know, I should be mourning the death of Prince who passed away, who's a significant part of my life. And I know this is all about Priest today, so I don't want to turn off anybody watching that or listening to this. But ironically, I got to – yes, sweetie, I'll be right there. Sorry, I have two cats, a little local local color here. My two cats uh, want dry food, but it's too early for them to eat it. Um, so you have to go, go see these guys because, I mean – you know, the whole idea is if this is a farewell tour or not, or if this is going to be the end of, I don't think they're done yet. I think they'll probably do another album probably sooner rather than later. Um, because if they keep at the cycle of uh, albums that they've been doing, if, this, if they tour in another seven years and do release another album, they're going to have to do this one a lot quicker, I think, because they all know the clock is ticking. I mean, the band will eventually come to an end. We all know that. Uh, you know, Richie Faulkner's got um, Elegant Weapons, and Travis has been playing drums on the studio version of that. And if they do a second album, hopefully he'll go out on tour with that, because I like that music with Ronnie Romero, who did the whole reu uh, kind of rainbow reunion type thing for, for Richie Blackmore to kind of do that stuff. And, you know, R Richie, was that... Black, that other Richie a legend guitarist was, you know, hasn't played rock stuff like that in ages. So um, I, I think there's a pedigree of excellence that Faulkner will carry on post Priest. And who knows, maybe there'll be a version of Judas Priest down the road when Rob really retires. Who knows? Uh, or they'll just do a lot of, I think they're talking about probably doing a lot of one offs maybe just relegate themselves to doing still doing albums and maybe just doing festival headlining stuff, which would be great and would extend the shelf life of the band that way. I mean, is Rob going to be able to do this at 80, the way Mick Jagger's still out there touring at 80? Mick Jagger doesn't have to sing Painkiller. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> um, Mick Jagger gives a great physical show, but he doesn't have to sing Painkiller. He, he has to sing Start Me Up, which is far easier, but that's a story for another day. So the whole set list is pretty much, you know, for those of you who follow YouTube like I do, um, I'm going to go back and re-listen to the entire show. I said I was going to quit, but this energy about talking about the show is probably going to leave me winded. I'm, I'm getting the chills. I'm trying to walk around so you don't see me shivering. Go out and see the show. Um and seriously consider if you have the extra bucks, if you've been saving up in a good boy girl for Christmas and, you know, make Christmas come early and get a ticket at the very least to see these guys doing it. They are literally firing on all cylinders and being fourth row from the stage. As you can see how close that was. They are. You can see the joy. Richie Faulkner really connects with the audience and points at you when you're singing the words along. He's like, oh, I see you. I see. Very good at engagement with the audience, uh, particularly Richie Faulkner. Andy Sneap gets gets not the credit that he deserves. I got When I got to talk to him, I said, oh, thank you for all you do for the band. Again, I've said this probably earlier in this episode, but um, he really has taken the production of the band. It's just, you know, the fact that the way that they recorded this album, unlike Firepower, post you know, during and post the pandemic, is nothing short of a miracle. So you're definitely missing out if you don't see this. If you watch it on YouTube because you don't have money to see them, you, you're not getting the full picture off of somebody's phone, audio and visually. This has to be seen live. I mean, things like Love Bites which they did on the Receiver of Souls tour, for example. Brilliant. Even better than when they did then. Um, I just love that they're bringing, the, the set list for me is a pretty diverse one. They, you know, if you're only doing an hour and 37, hour and 38 minutes worth of, of, of songs, you're occasionally switching out a tune here and a tune there just to keep people on their toes, which is a great idea. 
you know, do it. Oh, one last thing I want to mention. People talking about Rob using a teleprompter. I will tell you, yes, there are moments he you could see him using the teleprompter. All right, there we go. I'm going to do this. Yes, you could see him doing the teleprompter. But let me, let me, I, I have to put the phone down for this. Yes, he was using a teleprompter. Oh, here, see the back of the shirt. This is a good one. So, yes, he was using a teleprompter. However, you've got a catalog like his. You did all the sex, drugs, and rock and roll like he did. You're going to forget a few words. Bill, Bruce Dickinson didn't do half the drugs and alcohol that, that, that Halford did. That's a given. Um, so his brain's a little sharper when it comes to that stuff. I've seen Bruce Dickinson screw up the words to the trooper back in 2008. So he's not infallible. He's he's messed up words to to songs and stuff before. It happens. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen him do it. Um, but Halford was not using the teleprompter nearly as much as people talk about. I mean, he really truly seems the happiest I've ever seen him live. And I've been seeing them for off and on for over four years. I've only caught. I haven't been to forty seven shows, but I've been to like nine or ten of them, including one with Ripper. When Glenn and KK were still you know, doing the jugulator demolition thing. And this is the interact the interplay and the interaction. I see the smiles on Travis's face, Travis Scott Travis's face, Andy Sneeps doing his thing, Ian Hill, Richie and Rob. There's clearly there's joy in their faces. And the audience, let me let's one last thing, and then I'm truly gonna go. The Santander Arena audience in Reading was truly in it, into it, in it to win it with the band. They were right there with the band, man. I, I, it was a loud, loud, rock, loud crowd, but not raucous. There was no riffraff that I saw. Of course, I was up front, so who knows. But uh, they were not only singing along with all the chestnuts, the, the absolute roar of people singing along to things like Panic Attack and crown of horns even uh which is a brilliant song just great i did promise a full review of the invincible shield album and at some point when i feel better i'll do that but i did want to share with you my experiences um if you're a prince fan who just happened to get all this way you probably aren't watching this if you're a prince fan but i don't want to you know, discriminate my audience. Uh, I, I would say us 80s babies listen to all kinds of music. We, you know, good music was good music back in the day. I kind of miss those days. <laughs> but they are alive and well in these guys and in the now. So go out and see them. But I will say the audience at Santander was just as much of an X factor in the success of the Priest show at, on Sunday, uh, April 21st. They really, truly were. And the staff there uh, could not have been nicer. It's one of the nicest venues I've been to in quite a long time of that size and uh, of, of a major, still relevant major recording artist like Priest, Rock and Roll Hall of Famers. And they deserved every bit of accolades they got. They truly put on a show. And having the backstage pass experience, seeing how the sausage is made only enhanced and added to that. And the crew that were Part of all that experience truly made it a worthwhile event. So that's all I got for you. You're, some of you out there are probably like, thank God he's going to shut up. But if you watch this far, you can tell I truly love the band. I truly love music. I truly appreciate the craft uh, that these guys put into their shows and albums and stuff after all this time. It is well worth going to see. So with that, I say stay true, stay humble, stay funky. Rock hard, ride free, to quote Priest. Um, be good to each other. Be good to yourselves. And I'll see you in the next podcast episode. Peace.